I must say that between the three here, three uh, gentlemen here, they command uh, a firepower, equity firepower, which is doing the rough numbers, some 90 billion US dollars, nine zero. Uh, so that's some serious money that we're talking about. Uh, Nejbhai, I want to start by start by asking you the first question. You know, in my at my home, in my building, in my complex, when I go outside, and I'm assuming that we have lots of, uh, you know, Guju friends here. You are one. I get asked this question a lot of times. Kya lena chahiye? Main aapse puchna chahta hoon kya lena chahiye? And and I know the answer by India, so uh, that will not do. <laughs> so Prashant by. First, let me start with a disclosure. Mutual funds are not taking any money from banks. When I receive money, it is by check. When I give money, it is by check. As per RBI's own data of financial flows of household in last three years, only about one lakh crore has come into equity. Only about 4 lakh crore has come into mutual funds, including debt mutual funds. About 9 lakh crore has gone into currency notes. Mr. Vaidyanathan, you have to fight with the currency notes. From your branches, you are dispersing 9 lakh crore worth of currency notes. This is depreciating Ashet Prasant by... And yet, Bankers keep on giving 9 lakh crore worth of currency notes to people. They are at 31 lakh crore of retail financial household. We are 4 lakh crore. There is no competition in our country. We are fighting with currency notes. Hopefully, this debate is settled. Thank you. I am sure you know, Mr. Vedanandan will have a, a question. We will open up the floor for that. But uh, to that question, Nilesh Bhai. Uh, so now, yeah. Prashant Bhai, we have reached a level where my cousins are telling me, Nilesh Bhai, a lailo, kale vadi jase. <laughs> and it actually goes up. So I am at the receiving end, and I am sure in audience, everyone has made far more money than my funds have made. So I'll take their advice. But you know, uh, that is a dangerous uh, one. We often hear, right, the old story, when the panwala tells you what to buy. So as Vaidhi mentioned that SME should have lower taxes, Vaidhi, you must have told this to SME Exchange IPOs. They are already discounting it. Uh, okay, I'll come back to you, Nelly uh, in just a bit. But Anish, uh, what's what's just that question? I mean, what to do in the market scenario, which has done so well? The run-up has been phenomenal. We are basically making new all-time highs. The corrections and the falls which come, they're short-lived. They're sharp. Not sharp, actually. They're shallow, and very very short-lived. Two three days, two three percent of the market right. Uh, sort of moves back up once again. So what is the thing to do? Okay. So the way I'd frame it is like in the markets, you get returns from two sources, either multiple expansion, the PE multiple expands, or you get earnings growth, right? I, I don't think anybody would argue at this point that multiples are cheap and multiples should expand further. They might, but I wouldn't bank on that, right? So really what you have to play for is earnings growth, right? And earnings growth then depends on what happens in the economy, right? Now. I'm of the view, and I think I share that with everybody else, that the economy is likely to do well over the next two to three years. So if the economy does well over the next two to three years, the sectors that will do well, right, the increment normally comes from the cyclical sectors, right, the domestic cyclicals. So these would be things like automobiles, financial services, cement, and um, capital, and, uh, capital goods. I know they've done well already, but if there is likely to be a positive earnings surprise, I would still play these sectors. Uh, Anish, I mean, and, you know, I'll make one more point. Yes, Between please. large bid and small cap, I, our view is that risk return trade off is clearly in favor of large caps at this point. Nilesh Bhai, you'll agree with that? You've been, on, you've been sort of advising caution for the last uh, <coughs> two quarters at least. We had a correction, but very short lived one. So we have been way early, and thereafter, markets have risen a lot. But I think what is worth avoiding also is important. Uh, the low floating stock counters are today trading at crazy valuations. And it will make sense to stay away from there. It might give you short-term pain because momentum can still continue to ride. But in the long term, this will benefit you. So just stay away from low floating stock, high expensive valuation counters. But do you agree with Anish's point, the skew has to be large caps? I mean, 
Undoubtedly, yes. Right okay. now, the risk return trade off is more towards large caps and larger mid caps. Uh, Prashant, uh, come in there. You have a sort of global, you manage global money and glo Goldman Sachs. Uh, you have $8 billion of assets under management now. A lot of it is foreign money. What is the perspective? I mean, uh, and you're getting money. You're still getting money. So where do you deploy? So we remain fully invested at all times. Even today, cash in the portfolio might be 10, 20 basis points, not even a percentage point. Uh, valuations, if you look at relative to India historically, we are not in the camp that they are, forget outlier, but last I saw, it is in line with the last 10-year average at the market aggregate level, at least as of month end, and I don't think March in particular, Feb, and I'm talking about, I don't think March in particular would have. And so I'll give you a precise number from what I recollect. It's a 20.7 times is the last 10-year average, forward 12 months, and we are at 20.5 times. So if anything, a smidgen below. There are pockets. now. Nowadays, you know, obviously, froth is oft mentioned word. So there are pockets of froth in small caps. But at an aggregate level, neither in large, nor in mid, nor in small, we never make that call that small is better. Large. My point usually is that it's hard enough to identify a undervalued stock. To be able to talk about in aggregate entire segment of the market being overvalued, we generally don't uh, you know, uh, make those forecasts, and we remain. Uh, as always, the opportunity, stock selection opportunities are the, often the best in the most inefficient segments of the market. They always tend to be mid and small. So that overweight, over allocation continues to be in mid and small relative to large at this time. So that's a bit of a slight difference, right, compared to what, how you are allocating money right now. I just want to, I'll come to specifics and what sectors make the most sense, et cetera. But you know, we heard uh, Manish talk about, uh, you know, and Ramdeji spoke about five trillion, ten trillion. Is there a reason? Is there a uh, need to pull back a little bit? Because sometimes we are looking at. I think Manish made that point that, uh, you know, when you look top down, you can make a ca bearish case, but you then indi study individual businesses and you see great opportunity, right? So it's not a maybe a, a like to like analogy, but is there a case to pull back a little bit? And I mean, if we're really at that moment where the decadal dividend, so as to speak, is to come our way. Uh, does it make sense to pull back and look at the bigger picture? Or is that, will that be getting carried away, Nilesh Bhai? So let me give you answer in a philosophical way, and Avni, Anish and Prashant can give on a more financial way. Do you believe there is a god upstairs? When I mean, you can see hardly anyone nodded. Now I'll prove to them God exists and he or she is an Indian. So let's look at oil prices. Israel Hamas war, oil production cut by Saudi and Russia. Russia Ukraine war, Red Sea disturbance. Oil should have been in triple digit. There is God which said Tathastu, it is in still double digit. US Fed three months ago was saying higher for longer. God said Tathastu now. Fed chairman is saying, I'll start cutting rates. Karnataka election, we were worried about government. If I make a statement here, Abki Bar, people will say, <laughs> by vote karna, <laughs> char so par. Vote on account, we were worried about, it will be freebies laced election vote on account. It was the shortest speech. I normally go to CNBC hours every budget time. We were villa for one hour. <laughs> you look at monsoon. Last year was below average. This year, God said, Tathastu, it is becoming with La Nina rather than El Nino, so it should be good enough. Look at the GDP growth number. We started at six. We are ending the year at eight. We do go wrong on such estimates, but not by 25% margin. Do you believe there is God upstairs and who is an Indian? If yes, then play like Sunil Nara and played yesterday. 
But you're making my point, Nilesh Bhai. So then, I mean, uh, that, then what I'm say saying is correct. You should you need to pull back a little bit and not get fixated on. Uh, on Yesterday on, you didn't watch Sunil Narayan batting. Uske tarab batting karo because upar wala sambal lega. Is that in jest or is that serious? No, no. I have many other points, but let them give the fine, <laughs> finer, real points. Uh, Anish, I mean, to that point, I mean, uh, you know, you look at valuations, you look at the, not the near term, but the next one year, two year, that's what we do. We look at earnings forecast, maximum two years out. Uh, but is there any case, and can you invest that way by pulling back a little bit and sort of riding on some of these mega trends, mega themes? Uh, valuations have always been rich, and maybe they're a little richer now, uh, but uh, so what, Nen uh, Anish? See, I actually don't take very strong 10-year views. Uh, there's always a very wide range of outcomes possible. I believe Indian economy has great potential to do really well, but we should evaluate in two or three year periods, right? I think there will always be cycles, there will be periods of booms, and there will be slumps in those 10 years. At this point though, over the next two or three year outlook, at least if I look at the economy, it looks very robust, right? And there are, actually I track four variables in the economy. One is cement consumption, second is automobile demand, third is home sales, and fourth is power demand. Right? Frankly, these are the only four variables in which you get hard, reliable numbers. Everything else, rural wages, etc., the numbers are, uh, you can make what you want to make of them. Right? So from a cyclical perspective, all these four numbers are strong. Right? If I look back you know, over the last couple of decades, there have been periods where these numbers have looked strong in the past, but what went wrong? Right? Home building is very, very critical. And if you see this cycle, this pickup started when home real estate market unfroze and activity started picking up. If I start seeing that house prices are appreciating but house volumes are not coming through, which is what happened in 2008, right? People were very happy that house prices were appreciating, but actually buildings were not being completed. Right? Then I would get worried, right? At this point, what I'm seeing is very strong home building activity with volumes. There are price increases. I don't necessarily like that, but at least volumes are coming through. If I see, look, cement capacity utilization has reached at a peak, or if power capacity is now fully utilized, then I would say, look, the cycle has peaked. I'm not saying the long-term outlook has changed, but the cycle has peaked. So, at, but at this point, I don't think we are at the peak of the economic cycle. There's a lot of new supply also coming, right? Samirin was earlier making that point. That, which is uh, good, which is good. Which so is that good. means so you'll have a longer uh, run, runway. Uh, runway, yeah. If, if you don't have capacity coming on, that's when demand exceeds capacity. Correct. And you get uh, the risk. Prices go up, but volumes, uh, units don't go up. <laughs>